Many years ago, a, a young man was caught in a thunderstorm when a lightning bolt struck the ground so close to him, it knocked him right off his feet. It frightened the life out of him. Well, it would, wouldn't it? The lightning bolt went right next to his feet, and he cried out, St. Anne, help me! If you help me, I will become a monk. This man had been brought up to believe that saints could be prayed to and that they would help anyone who asked for it. His father had wanted him to become a lawyer, but the young man kept his vow and he joined a monastery where he hoped he would find peace with God. Life at the monastery was tough. Prayers were seven times a day, sometimes beginning at 1.30 in the morning. The whole day was filled with manual work, Bible reading and prayer. Now that could have been the, the story of his life, just pressing on like that. Except for one thing. The more he understood about the Bible, the more he realized how holy God was, the more he was filled with an understanding of his own ungodliness. As he realized how great God was, he realized how sinful he was in comparison. No matter where he looked in his religion-filled life, he could see that he fell dreadfully short of God's high standards for his life. And you know what? It terrified him. It terrified him. So he set to work as hard as he could to make his life acceptable to God. He, he, went, he went without food often for three, time, three days at a time. In the winter, he slept on his bed without blankets. He confessed his sins daily, sometimes for as long as six hours at a time. In all this, he never felt that he had satisfied God. He wrote... If I could believe that God was not angry with me, I would stand on my head for joy. By the time he was 28 years old, he received his Doctor of Theology, and he started teaching the Bible at the local university. As he progressed through the, the Bible, he came to Paul's letter to the Romans, and he wrote in his diary, he wrote, I longed to understand Paul's letter to the Romans, and nothing stood in the way apart from one sentence in chapter 1, verse 17, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. What does it mean, the righteousness of God? I know that God is righteous, and him alone is righteous, but before him I stand a wretched sinner. I had no confidence that, that I could ever be right with God, he wrote. But eventually he, be, he came to understand the rest of that verse, which said, the, this righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as, is, as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And the lights went on. At last I understood he said, I've been trying to earn God's favor by all sorts of hard work, but now I understand that I can only be right with God by faith, by faith alone and not by good works at all. Now, some of you know the name of this man. His name was Martin Luther. Oh, what a great, what a great congregation. Well, you, you were ahead of me. As soon as I told about told the story about the lightning on the... You were with me, weren't you? Well done, guys. Martin Luther, Martin Luther. And he said, I felt myself to be reborn and gone through the gates into paradise. Martin Luther could see that the whole book of Romans and the letter to the Galatians taught one great theme, that we could never be right with God Except by, by, we can never be right with God by filling our days with good works, doing good things to try and please God. Because how, how would you ever know if you'd done enough? God's favor is earned through faith and faith alone. By believing in what God has done for us through the life, death, 
and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and nothing, absolutely nothing else can make you right with God except to believe that God has done everything through Jesus and to embrace it and to enjoy it. Martin Luther rediscovered the gospel of justification by faith alone. And as other people have caught that fire, the world has never been the same. Why do I speak about justification by faith alone? Because two weeks ago, when Lynn and I were here, David said in a throwaway comment in his sermon, he said, there are some things that need to be taught and taught, sometimes as many four, maybe five times. Things like justification by faith alone, David said two weeks ago. So I want to hammer that nail again, because the trouble is, we forget. We forget. Great doctrines like this leak. They leak out of us, and we, we try and make ourselves right with God by doing good things. Keep on doing good things, but it doesn't make you right with God. Faith alone. So I want to hammer on David's nail just w one more time today. So a couple of points. Number one is the horror of God's holiness. The horror of God's holiness. The, the doctrine of justification by faith alone is one of the greatest benefits to you and I that Christ has achieved on the cross in your place. It's been said that a church rises and falls on its understanding of justification by faith alone. So it's vital that you, that you understand it, that you grasp it, and that you live by it. Being right with God through faith alone. The word justification by the, the word justification means to be right in God's sight. And if we are ever to be right in God's sight, it would mean that you would have to live a perfectly moral life every moment of every day. Well, for the last hour, how are you doing? For this day. Has your life been morally perfect in every aspect? Every thought, every action, every word. Have they all been perfect and honouring to God? Mine hasn't. Mine hasn't. And if you're honest, you'll admit that yours hasn't either. So, so, so we failed even today. God's day. We failed. I'm not asking if you approve of all that you say and do. I'm not asking if your granny would approve of all you say and do. I'm asking if a holy God would approve of all you say and do. And particularly think. Particularly think. Isaiah, the prophet of the Old Testament, he was the best of men. But when he saw God's holiness in Isaiah chapter 6, he felt absolutely crushed. When he saw God's glory in, Acts, in, in Isaiah 6, verse 5, he wrote, Woe to me, he cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. If Isaiah, the best of the Old Testament prophets, was crushed when he saw God's glory, what about you? The same thing happened in the New Testament. In Luke chapter 5, Peter, the leading uh, d disciple, Peter had been fishing all night long and he caught nothing. So Jesus told him to go out into the deep water, throw your nets out on the other side, and Peter did that, and he, and he found that the nets were so full that the, the nets began to break from the weight of the fish that he caught. And in Luke 5, verse 8, as Peter saw the power of the Lord Jesus demonstrated in that massive catch of fish, he couldn't help but fall on his knees and cry, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. He saw 
the power and the majesty of Jesus. And he could, he was crushed. So how about you? If the best of the Old Testament prophets and the leader of Jesus' disciples felt crushed when they compared themselves to, to Jesus and to God, what about you? How will you stand up to them? But you can't. You can't. And that's what this, this beautiful doctrine of justification by faith alone is all about. Because we cannot stand before God by ourselves. We can't. Why? Because we're sinful. Because we're sinful at heart. Sin is definitely the bad stuff that we do. But it's not just stuff. Sin isn't just the things that send people to prison. Sin isn't just murder, rape, and stealing. God's standards are so high that your envy, your jealousy, your greed, your pride, we're good at that one, your pride are sinful before Almighty God. And of course, sin isn't just the bad stuff that we do. Sin is the good stuff that we don't do. Sin is the good stuff that we don't do. At the, at the end of the story of the Good Samaritan, what did Jesus say? He said, go and do likewise. I have to say, we evangelicals are really good at avoiding that sentence. Jesus said, go and do likewise. We evangelicals are not good at helping the way the Good Samaritan did. The good things that we don't do are sinful in God's eyes. So not helping the widows and the orphans as the Bible commands us, not helping them is sin. Not loving one another, not forgiving one another, that is sinful in God's eyes. God despises every act of yours that does not bring him glory. And I have got a list of my long in my heart even today. So many things that don't bring God glory in my life. So I'm, I should be crushed before him. Because it's no good comparing yourself to other people. Yeah, I'm, I'm not perfect, but I'm not bad. I'm not as bad as that, that kid across the classroom. I'm not as bad as that fella down the street. That's not good enough. You can't compare yourself to other people. You have to compare yourself to God's holiness. And by that standard, we fail, don't we? We fail. Every shade of sin in your heart is heinous to a holy God. The bar that God sets for your standard of conduct is outrageously high. Is there any hope? There is. There is hope. In the book of Romans, up, up to chapter 3, Paul, Paul has spent the first two and a half chapters explaining how the Gentiles, the Greeks, are far away from God because of their sin even though their consciences tell them that they are sinning against a holy God. And he goes on, and you, he, he, he could kind of hear the Jews saying, yeah, you tell them, Paul, you tell them. Those Gentiles are dreadful, aren't they? And then he turns his attention to the Jews and say, yeah, but you lot are just as bad because you've got the Ten Commandments and you don't obey them. So the Gentiles are far from God because of their sin, and the Jews are far from God because you've got God's word and you're not obeying it. So Paul throws a net round all of them in Romans 3 verse 10 and says, there is no one righteous. No, not one. That's you and I. That's you and I. It's not just the, the Jews and the Gentiles of Bible days. It's you and I today. There, was n there is no one righteous no, not one. Righteous is being right in God's eyes. None of us, none of us are righteous. 
every single member of the human race is on a level playing field before a holy God. So whether you're a priest serving mass in a glorious cathedral or somebody shooting cocaine on a street corner, all of us fall short of the glory of God. So if we are ever to be right in his sight, we need help, don't we? We need help because we're never going to reach God's standards by ourselves. So my second point is the wonder of justification. My first point was the horror of God's holiness. The second point is the wonder of justification. Let's, let's go back to the Bible, please, and read from verse 21. So Paul's described how, how sinful we all are. There is none, no one righteous, no, not one. Verse 21 in Romans 3, Paul says, But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So if we are utterly helpless before God, what chance have we ever got of ever being right before him? How will we stand on the day of judgment? Through Jesus Christ and faith in him alone. That's how. Have we got any Batman geeks in the, the hall today? Any Batman fans? Oh, um, oh we have a, we, a couple of uh, embarrassed hands are going up here. Our son-in-law is a Batman geek. Our son-in-law, in his mid-30s, has a Batman lunchbox. A Batman mug. A Christmas Batman jumper bought by my wife. Mm. In, the, in the movie Batman Returns, Catwoman has had a very shady background as a professional burglar. She desperately wants to wipe her slate clean and start again. Like all of us, Catwoman's past is recorded on the internet. Did you know all of, there's so much information about you on the internet? All of your emails are there, your medical record, your tax returns, your social media account. It's all on the, on the internet to be examined. Catwoman's past was on the internet and she was ashamed of it. You can't escape your past because it's all recorded on the internet. But the word on the street for Catwoman is that somebody has, has d developed a powerful computer program called the Clean Slate, which can erase all of the information about you on the world's computers with just a few simple clicks of a button. Now, because Catwoman has a, a background of theft and espionage and burglary and arson, she'll do anything she can to get hold of that computer program Catwoman is like you and I. We all have a past. And what we would give to have a record of our past erased, not just from the world's computers, but from God's account. I have to say, guys, your eyes are lit up on the front row over here. When I talk about Catwoman, well done. <laughs> We've all done things that we are ashamed of. We've all done things that we wouldn't want our best friend or even our spouse, if you're married, 
we've all done things that we wouldn't want them to know for fear of it would change their attitude towards you. Do you not have that feeling? I do. And this is where Christ comes in. Because Jesus lived the perfect life that God's holy law demanded. Jesus kept every one of God's 613 laws in the Old Testament. Jesus kept every one every day. And so as God is holy, Jesus is equally holy. And that's why it Jesus' baptism in Luke chapter 3, God declared to a listening world, this is my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. I love the way God uses that Geordie expression there. I'm well pleased with you, says God to his son Jesus. Jesus' whole mission was to live the perfect life as our representative as your representative so that his perfect record could be transferred to you if you have a simple faith in him if you are a Christian by yourself yet utterly hopeless and helpless before a holy God but amazingly through a simple faith in Jesus Christ you can receive the gift of eternal life as the record of all of your sins is transferred to Jesus, where he took the punishment on the cross. The moment you believe that you are a sinner and that Christ died for your sins, taking the punishment upon himself, the divine transfer takes place. All of your sin, all of your shame, all of your pride, your greed, your lust, your envy, your selfishness, your, the entire record of your sin is transferred to Jesus and his perfection and beauty is transferred to you. So you can wear it like a cloak. You can wear the perfection of Jesus like a cloak, a cloak around you so that it hides all of your sin and your shame. In exchange, God imputes the righteousness of his precious son Jesus to you if you have a simple faith in Jesus. Christ's record of perfect submission to God's holy law is given to you because he loves you, because you are precious to him and he wants you to live forever with him in glory. It's amazing, you know, it really is amazing that God loves you so much that he would send his son to the cross because of the selfish things that you've done. What a wonderful God who would do that for wretched, for selfish people like you and me. What a wonderful God he is. What a wonderful God. And when you believe in Jesus like that, your slate is wiped clean. If only Catwoman had known the gospel, she would have found what she was looking for. Our natural inclination is to try and impress God with how good we are. This was brought home to me a couple of years ago when I met, I met a friend of mine called Dave. I hadn't seen Dave for a, a couple of years. And as, as we, we chatted, then he's, he asked me if I was still involved in church. I said, yeah, sure. He said, you'd be pleased to know I've started attending church. I said, oh, really? That's great. Good on you, Dave. What made you do that? He said, well, as I'm getting older, I know that I've done a, a lot of things. I've messed up a lot of times. So what I wanted to do was to, to tip the balance. I said, tell me more. He said, well, yeah, as I've got older, I understand that I've made a lot of mistakes. And so my balance is tipped. If I, I thought if I started going to church, that would tip the balance. He didn't say it in God's eyes, but that's what he meant. He meant that his good works would 
outweigh his bad works, and then God will be pleased with him. And I had to say, I'm sorry, mate. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. So I, I explained as simply as I could that God is not interested in a balance. He's not interested in our good works and bad works being on a balance and God will weigh them up and see wh which way you'll go when you die. God's not interested in that. So I explained that it, it's all about faith in Jesus and that Jesus has done everything necessary for us to be saved. And as I explained, he looked at me and said, Do you know, that is so brilliantly profound and brilliantly simple. It must be from God. Because you and I could never make up a story where God would come down to save wretched people like us by dying on the cross. It's brilliantly profound and it's brilliantly simple that Jesus should die and that we should believe and then be right with God. That's, that's justification by faith alone. In the Old Testament, we have the prophet Zechariah. And in Zechariah chapter 3, we read about a man called Joshua. Not Joshua who walked round the walls of Jericho, a different Joshua. And in Zechariah chapter 3, we, we read, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of God. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin. I've taken away your sin, and I will put fine garments on you. The filthy clothes that Joshua was wearing were a picture of his sin. And as his filthy clothes were taken away, so too was his sin. And notice that God did it. And the new clothes he was given were a gift from God. And that's what you and I, that's your condition. Before a holy God, your sin means that you are kind of dressed in filthy rags, just like Joshua was. And you're utterly helpless and hopeless to clean yourself up. But out of his kindness, out of his grace, the Lord removed Joshua's filthy clothes and replaced them with a beautiful new set of clothes. It was a free gift that Joshua did not earn and he did not deserve. It was a free gift from a gracious God who loved him. And as Joshua Sorry, as God removed Joshua's sin and replaced it with righteousness, because that's what the story is about, so too will God do that for you if you have that simple faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. 200 years ago, Charles Wesley wrote in the hymn, And Can It Be? He wrote, No condemnation now, I dread Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. No condemnation now I dread, and just like Joshua, clothed in righteousness divine. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that glorious? This is the promise that God gives to those who believe in Jesus. Earlier, the Apostle Paul said in verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. But in verse 22, he says, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who 
believe. There is no difference. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Before God, we are all sinners, every last one of us. But through Jesus' death on the cross, we can be right in God's eyes through faith alone. And it's a gift of his kindness, a gift of his grace to us. And the wonderful thing is that this justification, this, this declaration, it's, it's a legal standing and it cannot be taken away. So if once you have faith in Jesus, then you are justified forever. You'll not lose it by messing up again tomorrow. It's a permanent legal declaration and it's wonderful. So today, you, if you're a Christian, you are as right in God's eyes as you will ever be. How cool is that? You're right in God's eyes today as you'll ever be. It doesn't come and go according to your obedience and devotion to God. It's a standing before a pure and holy God that you are his child, that you are his child, clothed in the perfection and beauty of Jesus forever, forever. This is the massive, massive benefit of what Christ achieved on the cross because he loves you, because he loves you. And it's all because of what Christ achieved on the cross. So Christian, if you're a Christian here today, lift up your heart to King Jesus, the Lord and glory of heaven. And love him, for he is worthy. Love him more than yourself. Love him more than your career. Love him more than your sin. If you're not, not yet a Christian, and I really hope there are some, some people who are in the room today or what, watching on Zoom who are not yet Christians, if you are not yet a Christian, there's nothing to stop you from coming to Christ today. Confess your sin and acknowledge that Jesus is your Lord. Simple words like, God, I've messed up and I need your help. Take me. And he will. And he will. If you're not sure about that, ask me. Ask me later or ask David or one of the other church leaders. We'd be thrilled to help you. But remember, a church rises or falls according to its understanding of justification by faith alone. Embrace it. Delight in it. And live your life not trying to impress God by doing good stuff, but by faith alone. And oh, what a, what a pressure that takes off us, that everything necessary has been done by Jesus, the wonderful Saviour who loves you so, so much.